Well, among the voices and personalities that are resonating in the Iranian diaspora these days is a young woman who is offering regular tidbits of advice on emotions, on relationships, on stress, on health, and doing so on Instagram. In fact, she's built a large following in Iran and around the world for her online therapy and insights. And even more charmingly, she does it all with a New Zealand accent in English. Her Persian is impeccable, of course. Tina Parsamand is a psychologist and psychoanalyst who moved from Iran to New Zealand when she was nine years old. After growing up and living much of her 20s in that tiny perfect nation, she decided to return to Iran first on a visit and then ended up staying. Now Tina is a highly in-demand therapist in Tehran and is perhaps best known for her Instagram channel, Insight with Tina Parsa, where her words are resonating across the the globe. And right now, Tina Parsamand joins me from Dubai today. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jian. Hi, very nice to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for, thank for you. doing this. Listen, I know you live in Tehran now, but you're in Dubai, um, hoping to get a visa to see your mom in the United States. Do I have that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And how's that going? Not too bad. Well, still waiting to hear from the embassy, but... Um, Fingers crossed it'll work out okay. What is Dubai like right now in the time of COVID? Um, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Well, they're quite strict about like wearing masks everywhere, um, which is good. But um, everywhere is open, restaurants, bars, um, you know, everything's still going, shopping malls. You just have to wear a mask. So, yeah, it's fine. It's so it, would you say it's similar to Iran? Uh, no, in Iran, nobody really like takes it seriously now. They did used to like at the beginning, but now like not many people wear masks. And um, really, people are not even wearing masks. No, 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 no. Lots of people are not wearing masks. But here is really strict. Like if you want to get a taxi, only two people are allowed on the taxi. When you go to restaurants, there's a space between like each table. Um, but in Iran, none of that, none of that is happening. <laughs> Oh, right, well, <laughs> we need to talk to a therapist about this. Oh, wait, we have one. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll have to ask yeah. you about that in a moment. Uh, first of all, what happens to all your clients or, or patients, or I don't know what you call them, when you go away? Um, well, basically, I try not to cancel my sessions because I um, have realized I become a very important part of my clients' lives because... Um, you know, psychoanalysis takes many years. Sure. So some of my clients, we've been together for maybe three, four years and once or twice a week. Um, so I've become a very important part of their life. So I try not to cancel sessions. And with the COVID situation, all of them are working um, online with me via video calls. So I'm, I'm still doing the sessions while I'm on holiday or going away. I try uh, to continue their sessions despite like being overseas. Got it. Tina, yeah. you, you've said that therapy is hot right now in Iran, which is, which is good to mm -hmm. hear, frankly, in the sense that psychologists have often talked about the reluctance of Iranians to seek professional mm -hmm. help when it comes to tough times or stress or even mental illness. Tell me about yeah. therapy being all the rage. How did that happen? I think one is probably social networks because there's lots of psychologists out there on like Instagram, um, you know, informing people it's okay to get therapy. You don't have to have a serious mental illness to go to a, to a therapist. You just might want to have someone you could really talk to about anything. You know, you don't have to feel to yourself. So I think social networks has had a positive impact and also you know, um, being exposed to some of maybe like the Western culture, um, you know, globalization, people are becoming more open minded about things, maybe becoming more integrated with the Western culture. So um, I do realize they don't like to call it therapy. They like to call it counseling. So they <laughs> say we're going to a counselor because we just need counseling regarding like some of our decision makings right, and things like right. that. So we haven't crossed the therapy threshold yet. We can't call it therapy, but we'll <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But do they do. Yeah. Especially the younger, you know, people in their twenties, in their thirties. Like I have clients 
they're teenagers and they're like our parents don't even know we're coming to therapy we've wow. you know saved up money to come to therapy i'm uh, really amazed i was gonna really i was gonna ask if it's generational if you're finding that i mean you're yeah. young so I, maybe that's part of it and you're you've got this instagram channel and stuff but but are your clients do they skew younger rather than older yeah yeah definitely definitely people like uh, below 45 maybe years old 50 years old more attempt a lot more than say people over 50 years old this might be a weird question but where do they get the money is it are they rich kids you know um to my surprise no a lot of them aren't and they they tell me they like we've saved up we are not going to our hairdresser we're not going to the gym we're not doing this not doing that and we're leaving that money for our therapy so they see it as an important part of their life wow that's that's yeah uh good to hear what 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 is yeah. the the most pressing issue or what would be among the pressing issues among your clients in iran these days relationships everyone <laughs> is uh, having you know concerns regarding their relationships yeah S so <laughs> So, so it's, <laughs> it's not really breaking news. That's that's the ongoing. Uh, uh, is that any different from any other time? Do you think, or uh, is that what you would have normally dealt with? No, it's it's always been like this. I mean, with my non-Iranian clients, with my Iranian clients, with basically everyone from all ages, it's mostly relationships because you know you don't really have. Well, you do have internal conflicts, but. Your conflicts become uh, much more significant when they are in interpersonal, so when they are with other people. So, yeah, relationships are a big deal. Is there a, a difference between those you see in Iran versus Iranians outside of Iran who solicit your help? Um, I couldn't. I'm not really able to generalize. Um, people have their unique, you know, problems. I can't really group them into separate. Um, but I guess there are more like um, with Iranians in Iran, they're affected by financial problems, which obviously those overseas aren't. Uh, they're affected by some of the, you know, political issues, things like that. But um, in intrapersonal, so things that are going on inside a person are pretty much the same. I Universal. think everywhere. Right, right. Um, yeah. And and the intrapersonal isn't just then about relationships. I mean, you. I'm I'm assuming you have people coming to you going, I'm stressed out. I or I you know yeah. I, I, I I don't know how to yeah. deal with my lack of uh, funding or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This popular Instagram channel that you have this this was something you started when you moved back to Iran a few years ago. Yeah. What what was the impetus for starting this? Well, you know, what I what I realized is that um, regarding people's income, a lot of people, a lot of the people uh, living in Iran can't afford therapy. Um, and I realized, you know, people want to be educated, people want to know these things, but they, not everyone is able to afford therapy, even like even though there are places that don't charge much, but still, still those people can't afford it. Yeah. So I thought, why not, you know, start a an Instagram page where I can just like share some of my knowledge for free. So those that can't afford therapy, at least they can get some insight. So that's my, that was my first, you know, motive for doing this. So you didn't start it with business concerns in mind. No, no, I didn't. Because I'm a psychoanalyst, I work with a very few number of clients. I already had those clients. I've been working with them for many years. So I didn't really, was. it wasn't something for me to gain clients with. I, it was uh, my way of like contributing, I guess. And yet it's become <laughs> good business for you. I can only imagine in terms of your name getting yeah. out there. Has it surprised you how successful it's become? Yeah, it has actually, because I don't really advertise my page. Um, it's just been like, you know, people sharing my posts, my stories. Um, and I get a, f a lot of positive feedback, you know, inspiring messages, people telling me, you know, I've read this, it's made a big change in my life. I just realized this. And, you know, it's it, it motivates me. It motivates me to work harder. It, it really does. I found out about you because 
a friend of mine in California is a huge mm-hmm. fan of yours and follows you on your Instagram channel. Um, mm-hmm. She's she's a woman in her thirties, like you. Uh, I mean, you're this progressive young woman. Does your does your audience skew female, or do you have a lot of men following you as well? Mostly women. Well, you know, through the Instagram um, app, I found out most of them are female and in their thirties. Right. Well, they yeah. they you they can identify yeah. with you, or you can identify with them. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This person's yeah. a huge. Yeah. Fan. I mean, I've heard. You know, you really do have an effect on people, which is fantastic to hear. Take take us Thank back you. to how this all happened, because you've had an interesting journey. You were born in Iran, but you yeah. left for New Zealand. I'm presuming yes. with your parents. You didn't. You didn't just pack a bag and go at nine years old by yourself. <laughs> uh, so, no, I was with my parents. Right. This is 1996. Why New Zealand? Um, good question. Um, my my dad had an aunt in Australia um, who had lived there for like, maybe she moved like 40 years ago. And um, she always said, you know, move to Australia. It's such a beautiful place. It's this and that. And then the immigration laws were quite, you know, strict. They were. It was quite difficult to move to Australia. And she said, you know, there's a little island next to Australia, uh, New Zealand. Maybe it's easier to move there. So yeah, my parents applied and you know they got a work permit and we there we go. We moved to New Zealand and we had no we didn't even know which city we were going to. <laughs> right. Um so we were searching for the capital and we found out it was Wellington, but then we found this Iranian friend, um a, a faraway relative, and he said, No, 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 don't go to Wellington, it's um not very populated. Come to Auckland. So we moved to Auckland, we had no <laughs> idea where we were going. But it worked out okay. When we first moved there, I think there was only about a thousand Iranians living in Auckland. In uh, no, not Auckland, the whole of, in uh, all of New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. thought I thought Wellington was the cool city. Is Auckland cooler than Wellington? Yeah, Auckland is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is. okay. All right. I just remember the Mutton Birds always had that song called "I Wish I Was in Wellington," and they were a cool band. So I thought, <laughs> must be Wellington, must be the place. Um, did you remember as a nine-year-old how you felt about moving to to New Zealand? Was did your parents tell you we're going to go to this place? I mean, what what's it? What was it like for Tina in 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 Iran as a nine-year-old just before you were leaving? Well, when I was leaving, I was really excited because I I had seen all these like foreign movies and I thought we were going to like live in a farm and, um, you know, a farm. (laughs) Yeah, a farm. Why why a farm? (laughs) I thought you you were going to talk about Hollywood or something like, you know, New York skyline. (laughs) What was you saw movies about a farm? (laughs) Actually, New Zealand. No, there was. There was this like Canadian TV program and they showed like these kids in a farm and they would like have because I was obsessed with animals when I was little. Okay. So I thought I, I'm going to go live in a farm and I'm, I'm going to have, you know, a lot of animals and have all these friends that I'm going to play with. But to be honest, I had a very hard time when I moved there because um, I didn't speak English. It wasn't very multicultural when I moved there. Yeah. Um, I was bullied at school because I couldn't speak. Um, you know, the person next to me would say, hey, can I sit on this seat? And I, I wouldn't know what they're saying. So I just acted like I, you know, didn't know anything. And so I you're, was you're, you're this nine-year-old Iranian girl plopped into a New Zealand, into Auckland. And you didn't speak any yeah. English at all? I didn't speak. I Well, my parents sent me to like English, uh, you know, English classes in Iran, but they were no use. Right. Especially with the New Zealand accent, I didn't understand anything. Right, right. It's hard in the best of times for some people to understand yeah, the New Zealand accent, yeah, yeah, even yeah. if they're I fluent in English. Yeah, and and so um, how did that bullying affect you? It was it was really difficult. It was really difficult, um, especially uh, also because of the cultural difference. Like I would take. Or Masabzi to school and people would tell me, ew, what are you eating? It smells so bad. So I had to like run away to, uh, you know, my little uh, lonely spot at school so I could just like eat my lunch alone. Um, so yeah, I had a very hard time. Um, it was very difficult, very difficult first couple of years. I, I remember the first day I went to school, I came back home and I was like, mom, I want to go back. Just take me back. 
and she was like no you'll fit in it took me like a whole year i was like uh, always begging her to go back and then i finally learned how to speak english and settled uh, but yeah the first uh, i always say like um take your kids prepared you know you can't just take a kid that doesn't speak english and especially if the country is not very multicultural if you don't have yes say people of the same culture of the same language yes. there you have to take your kids prepared i wasn't prepared it was a I had a hard time, but it helped me, you know, grow. It's interesting because as a, as a kid who grew up in the diaspora, me, uh, you know, I was a kid in the 1980s and I I talk about being called a terrorist and all these difficult times we had. And mm. by the 90, mid-90s or certainly by the 2000s, somebody coming to a, from Iran to a place like Toronto or a place like LA or Washington, D.C. or London can find a Persian community there, which we didn't have when I was a kid, but exists here exactly. now. A place like Malton, New Zealand, even I guess later uh, later on, as you say, in the, in the late 90s, it's it's still a pretty homogenous place. So you're experiencing all those things. And it's really important to talk about this because there is this myth sometimes, as we've talked about many times on this program, that Iranians, we're just like everybody, else. you know, nobody would notice us. If it, and, and you know, these are the stories where we realize we're not, you know, that, that they can tell yeah. that you're uh, uh, that you're from somewhere else, if not uh, uh, Iranian. Um, did they exactly. know you were Iranian or did they think or they, they just knew you were from somewhere else? Uh, no, they didn't even know where Iran was. So they would say, where are you from? And I would say Iran and they say Iraq. So Iraq. And I'm like, no, two different countries. Um, and they would say, so you ride camels in your in your country? <laughs> and, you know, they had no idea. I, I wouldn't blame them. New Zealand was a very lonely, you know, little island in the Pacific Ocean. So they didn't really know anything about Iran. And um, yeah, I didn't, because I was quite patriotic as a child. I didn't really like some of the comments they gave. Um, yeah, I, I would say it was difficult. How did your parents adjust? I think, you know what? Um, I think it's actually easier for adults than for children or for, uh, if you if you go as a, very small child say if you're if you leave iran when you're like three or four or if you're born abroad uh, you basically integrate totally in the new culture i would have been a new zealander if i had moved there at the age of like two or three right right um if you go as an adult there is no there is not so much pressure to integrate in the new culture you see so many adults that go there they find their little like iranian community they stick to their like iranian friends they just you know they don't really have to mix with the new culture they can just isolate themselves but when you are at that sort of age like when i was eight i wasn't young enough to totally you know speak english properly you know be a total New Zealander. I had that Iranian background. I had that language difference, that cultural difference. And I wasn't old enough to have my little like Persian community and yeah. not have to really be part of the New yeah. Zealand culture. Yeah. Like my parents, they had their Iranian friends. They just went to work, had very limited contact with foreigners, came home. That was it. But for me, it wasn't like that. I was sort of in between. And I really had to, you know, both keep my Iranian culture so I could communicate with my parents and my family. And I had to integrate in the New Zealand culture at the same time. So it gave me a lot of perspective. So it was difficult, but it helped me see um, how like a human being can have different perspectives, can be multicultural, can um have like a variety of um, values, belief systems, that kind of thing. So it's both difficult, I think, at that age, um, uh, but you can also learn a lot from it. Tell me about those cultural differences from a from a socio political standpoint. Like um, uh, as you head into your teens and and your early twenties, what was it like being from a place that is generally considered? Uh, an oppressive, uh, at least politi politically uh, and socially, patriarchal country to a nation like New Zealand that is generally viewed as super progressive and liberal? One thing I experienced 
Iranians that have moved abroad like many years ago, they sort of preserve that culture from like back in the 80s or back in the 90s. Like my parents, they were a lot more strict than parents living in Iran because they had preserved their like belief systems from the 90s, whereas those living in Iran had upgraded. So they were quite um, traditional, my parents having really traditional parents and living in a country that was, you know, very rebel, or liberal and free and that kind of thing. Uh, during my teenage years, it was a bit difficult. They sent me to a co-ed school. They were quite strict. Um, yeah, I had, uh, it was a little bit difficult. I think uh, basically I integrated gradually, gradually. I understood that people could have different ways of thinking and i accepted that um i didn't expect people to think like my parents or think like me or uh whatever i just accepted that people can see things differently there's the flip side of it too which is that the country that you move to i guess a lot like some place like canada is welcoming of people um, from all over the world or different races and 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 types and ethnicities and and so um, you you did have some of the benefits of that uh, in and around the respect that comes with it. Uh, there's an example I'm thinking of in my head. You know, we've talked a few times on this program because it's a particular pet peeve of mine about this um, offensive film from the early '90s called Not Without My Daughter. And oh my God. you have a story yeah. about Not Without My Daughter, which was used as a study book or something in your high school. Um, t- yes. t- t- tell us about that story. Oh, funny you know this story. Um, so basically, um, in my high school, we had to read a novel as part of our um, English class. So this wasn't English. This wasn't ESOL. It was English for everyone. Um, we had to read this book and write essays on it and that kind of thing. So the book they had chosen that year was not without my daughter, uh, the book and the film. And suddenly everyone was talking about it and they like, oh my God, what is the country you're living at? We can't believe you treat women that way and that kind of thing. So, you know, a lot of racism, a lot of racism at the time. So I went to my uh, dean and I said, you know, People are giving me a hard time. Why, why would you, you know, teach this at school? Imagine what would happen to someone from Iran or even the Middle East, um, you know, with, with the approach you're teaching the kids at school. And um, they were really nice about it. I mean, one thing I loved about New Zealand is that you really had a say in everything. Even a small child at school, this was part of the curriculum. It was set. It was, you know, all our exams, essays, everything was supposed to be on this book. And I go to them and I'm like, look, I'm having a hard time because you're teaching this at school. And they basically removed it from the curriculum. So, you know, the, the good thing is, okay, there were some things that might hurt you, but you always had a say in it. It's amazing. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. The, the amazing part of that story is the strength that you have as a kid to go and say, uh, hey, uh, this book should be taken off the curriculum. <laughs> I don't know if I would have yeah. that. That uh, Well, maybe I would. I, but, well, how old were you? Were you in, in high school when you did that? Yeah, high school. I was, I think, 14. Good for you. Chalk won a, yeah. a, a win for uh, our team that we got not, not without my daughter taken off the curriculum in a New Zealand school. You've also <laughs> said that you wanted to help people you've always known as a teenager that you wanted to help people where did that instinct to want to help out the 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 idea of the collective come from you know i've been through a lot in my own life i've been lonely you know when i when i moved to new zealand i was a lonely child with no family i was bullied um you know i came from a quite wealthy family but when we moved there you know, the Toman wasn't worth anything. So we were living a quite a poor life, I would say. So I've been through all that and I know how it feels and I know how lonely I felt when I was going through that and I didn't have any help. So from what I've been through, I've been I've become very passionate about like when I didn't have a hand that would like help me out of the 
out of that situation and i didn't have a i didn't have a friend i didn't have anyone to talk to so i know how that feels and i want to be that companion for other people i didn't have it but i can provide it for somebody else mm. so that's i think a major driving force having been through very difficult times and not having any support i wanted to be that support for other people and you end up becoming a psychologist the so so mm. i guess i guess the dream of being an astronaut slowly died <laughs> <laughs> i i've always been i was a very curious child i was always fascinated about knowing things that sometimes I wasn't supposed to know. I remember I uh, the first um, time I asked my mother how babies were made, I was maybe about seven years old and she's like, well, where did you get that idea from? So I was always um, wanted to know things, wanted to find out things and astronomy was fascinating for me because, you know, uh, space is so mysterious. But I still I still really enjoy it. I still watch like BBC documentaries on astronomy and stuff. I, it's really fascinating. But I s found something more fascinating and that was the human mind. So you've said, so well, yes, you did find something quite fascinating, the human mind. And you you know, you've talked about this really I found interesting. You've talked about being a how being a psychologist helps you to not be scared. Do you remember saying that? Yes. What What does that mean? In what context um, did I say this? Because I've said it in different ah, ways. Ah, I see. Um, well, in the context that I saw you say it, you said it you, because um, you uh, are always aware that there's going to be some kind of solution in life. Yeah. Well, basically, uh, studying psychology it first helped me. It first helped me face my own fears. Um, uh, go into my own fears and at the end of it you realize you know um, you've sort of catastrophized about things that aren't really going to happen or aren't really as bad as you think they were um, then when you work with clients gradually gradually you see how you know hand in hand you could make a difference so you don't you don't really have to fear complications that people are facing it things can be done you can be active i mean i always talk about in the worst of situations there is still a range of actions you can take that will make that very difficult situation just a little bit better mm -hmm. so there's always things you can do even in at the worst of times so that that gives you a sense of um authority in life so you can go fight things you can make a difference so it basically makes you less fearful of things mm. i would say tina tell me about the decision to return to iran six years ago you you're you're in new zealand you've now you've assimilated you're a new zealander you're uh doing well you've got you're working on your masters you're you you decide to visit iran at what point do you make the decision that this is going to be a permanent move back to Iran? So basically, it wasn't a decision, really. Um, I always wondered about Iran. I, I had this passion for Iran. Um, I remember, so when I moved to New Zealand, I hadn't uh, visited Iran like for maybe six, seven years. And then I visited and it was very different for me. The first week, I didn't really like it. I couldn't really connect with the environment and the people. Uh, but gradually, you know, I found my little place um, and I connected with people. And then I would go back every maybe one year or two years just for holiday. And every time I went, I felt this connection. I always say, you know, I've actually researched on this. There's a concept called uh, place attachment. So they say um, when you're born, the first few years of life, you get attached in a different way, in a very deep sense with the closest people to you, like your parents or mm, your very, yeah. um, or your family. 
Um, so they say the same thing happens with the place you spend the first few years of your life. You have this very unique attachment to that place and it's called place attachment. And um, for me, uh, I could really feel that. I felt this unique attachment to Iran. It was like a parent for me. So your parent might not be the best parent. They may be impolite. They might sometimes not treat you well. They might be this and that. But you feel different about them. So uh, somebody, if somebody tells you, hey, um, you know, let go of your dad and we will grant you a different father who's, you know, very polite, very rich, very understanding, very this, very that. Um, but you have to forget about your own dad. And most people would say, no, I don't want to do that sure, because yeah. they are not my dad. Right. I still have these, these unique feelings for my own dad. Iran feels like that for me. It's like a parent. It might not be perfect. Well, it, it isn't. And um, it has a lot of faults, but you feel this like very unique attachment because you were born born there and because maybe your parents were from that culture. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, because I spent the first few years of my life there. So I always felt this unique sense towards Iran. Every time I went there, it was different for me. It was different to everywhere. Um, so when I finished my master's in New Zealand, I thought I wanted to go travel the world, see, explore. And I went like traveling in Southeast Asia and Europe. And the last destination was Iran. So I go there. I thought I'll spend one or two months, which I did. And then I thought, oh, I'm having a good time. Why not spend like six months? So I stayed another six months and then I thought I'll stay another year. And mind you, my parents didn't move back with me and I have no family. I basically have one uncle in Iran and that's it. Uh, most of my like father's family have moved overseas maybe like 30 years ago. My mom's family also same thing. So I don't really have any family there either. And they were all panicking. They're like, what are you doing? You don't know the place. Um, you don't know the culture, you don't have anyone there. So they were very discouraging my family when I moved there. And I was like, no, don't worry, I'm just exploring, I'll move back soon. Um, so I spent an, a year and then two years and I've been there for the past six years. Wow. So it wasn't really a decision, it was just a thing that just, um, a process that took place and yeah. I've been, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. It's well, it's got to be more than good if you've decided that's your place. I mean, uh, you've also mm. taught you, you, you and I were talking uh, before and, and you were saying that you found um, life is more meaningful for you in Iran. And that's a, that's quite a profound thing to say. I love the analogy you just drew or the metaphor of your of it, of it being like a parent and that attachment that you have. But more meaningful. What does that mean? I think I can contribute to the people of Iran a lot more than I would be able to contribute in New Zealand. In New Zealand, I'm just another psychologist, like many psychologists that are living there. They're well educated. They know what they're doing. There would be many of us. I'm not doing a unique job. But in Iran, you know, having taken that multicultural per perspective, having taken that, you know, education, um, having taken that life experience and taking all that back to Iran and working with the people that live there and maybe they don't have the chance to, you know, work with many psychologists like myself. I believe we have some of the base, best psychologists in Iran but not many of them um, around. So I think, you know, what I carry with me, the potentials I have, I can contribute a lot more when I'm living in Iran than when I would have lived in New Zealand. And that contribution, that making change uh, that I see, like that I'm doing in Iran, is making my life a lot more meaningful than it, that it would have been, say, in New it. Zealand. In New Zealand, doing psychology would have been my career, but in Iran, it's my lifestyle. It's, it's part of, like, making meaning for my life, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, do you have to clear your throat, 
Are you okay? <laughs> I'm fine. I <laughs> got, to got some, some vocal water. fry. I wasn't sure if you're doing that on purpose or not. It's very Britney Spears. <laughs> I want to ask you about. Uh, I know I can't keep you forever. I'll, I'll just get a few more questions. I want to ask you about Iranians sure. and the psychological disposition. Um, mm-hmm. Let's start with trust because mm-hmm. we often have guests on our show from the Iranian diaspora uh, who talk about how much lack of trust there is amongst Iranians, Mm -hmm. even in our families, Mm -hmm. you know, and some blame this, of course, on all the horrible events over recent decades in the home country. Do do you concur that trust is an issue for Iranians? And how do you try to address that? Trust, I think, is an issue. Definitely. Definitely. Um, One thing that doesn't make us united in whatever movement we try to, you know, do, I think is trust, because in any movement, you need to trust everybody else that's going to, you know, um, be part of that movement. And because people don't trust each other, they don't stay united. Exactly. So I think trust is a big deal. Um, why people don't trust each other? I think lots of different things. Firstly, the way we raise our children. I think we culturally, we lie to our children a lot. Like... Mm, I see like parents, they would they would say, hey, they would say to their child, hey, do this and I'll take you to the park. And they never do. It's just an incentive <laughs> that is never going to happen. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you you learn as a child that, you know, people aren't very honest with you. And then socially also, you know, people lie. Um, why do they lie? I think there's social and political things behind it that, I probably don't want to go into and um, but anyway the consequence is basically I think there is a big issue with trust amongst the Iranians definitely and do you I mean there's obviously no easy prescription for that but um, how do you how do we work on that the only thing I could think of just on the top of my head right now is with parenting with parenting just never lie to your children just tell them the truth um, and make a safe enough environment for them to live their own truth. So you tell them the truth and you allow them to tell you the truth also. So the, the, the family is safe enough. So whatever they're doing, they feel that they can really tell the truth and not get in trouble. Um, that's all that comes to my mind at the moment. There is also social and political things that can be done, but that's a different story. Tina, you've also said yeah. one of one of our issues as Iranians is that we are always looking for affirmation and confirmation from each other. How so? Yeah, I I, I just remembered w- which post you were talking about. Yeah, definitely, it's a big issue. People aren't living their truth because they're so obsessed with getting affirmation from other people i think it's a cultural thing you know we have uh, we have terms like abaru which you don't even have in english like if you find if you try to search that term there's no english uh, you know translation for it so basically um it's a big thing culturally to be approved by others to be affirmed by others and it really compromise you know people have to compromise a lot uh people have to move away from the ways they want to live and the things they want to achieve just because they want to satisfy uh other people and they want to be uh, affirmed so yeah it's a huge cultural issue would oberu be uh, status yeah kind of well sta- it's not really status i want to say you know um like yeah, like they say, Aberum raft. It's like losing face, but yes, you don't really face, use yeah. that kind of terms in English, do you? Right, you right, know? right. I mean, I guess you could say I, you're going to lose face, but not in the same way and not with the same gravitas <laughs> as as Aberum to get bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Um, the other thing that I found interesting that you've said is that 
um, you believe Iranians are passive. And, you know, when we were beginning the conversation and talking about COVID, it, it occurred to me, you said, oh, you know, the Iranians are not really wearing the masks. Um, I, I wondered if that's part of that disposition of like, oh, well, we can't be bothered. We've dealt with enough shit in our lives, you know, so who cares? This is just another thing. Uh, is that where you're going with that? Tell me about Iranians being passive. There's a psychological term. Um, it's known as learned helplessness. They've done studies on, they've done animal studies and human studies where you um, set a task for like an animal or a human and they try like, uh, say you, you tell a child to make a puzzle and they will make attempts and say if you make a puzzle so difficult that the child will fail and fail and fail over and over again, then they will give up. They won't make any more attempts. So basically, if people live in an environment where they will um, make attempts to achieve different things, and if those attempts are failed over and over again, they will reach the state which is called learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. And in that state, you no longer make any more attempts. You become hopeless. You don't care anymore. You accept whether, whatever that is happening to you. I think that's something Iranians have um, experienced for many years. They make attempts. They try to get their voice heard. Uh, they try to make a difference. And those attempts have failed over and over again. So in the society, in families, um, so in the small system and in the big system, the attempts are failed. So, you know, when we talked about me at school going to my dean and saying, you know, you're playing this yes. movie, you're teaching this novel, it's really affecting me. What happened? They made a difference. So what did I learn? I learned that if I, you know, follow up on something I believe in, I can make a difference. But say if I went to a school in Iran, likely they would say go back to your class shut your mouth this is what we're going to teach so i make that attempt once i would make different attempts at different situations and then if this failure happens over and over again i won't be making any more attempts i will be passive right. and i won't care anymore so when the iranians in iran right now when you mm -hmm. go back there and you go on the subway or you walk around the street or you see are not wearing masks the way they are in Dubai or the way we are here in Canada. Is that mm -hmm. learned helplessness? I think so. I think so. They, they, they believe in destiny. So what's destiny? Destiny is I have no say in what happens to me. If something is meant to happen to me, it will happen to me. So um, wearing a mask, taking precautions, taking care won't make a difference. So why not just, you know, be passive and not do anything about it? It's quite a tragic disposition, really. And it's mm. weird because it butts up against the the other sort of side of Iranians who, where we say, you know, with our superiority complex, you know, we are Sirus the Great and we, we come from this, yeah. you know, and, and yet we've, you know, that doesn't jive with helplessness, you know, of, I, well, it's a destiny. I don't know what I can do about this, this thing. You know, um, I did my master's, my uh, second master's degree uh, on this. It, I uh, researched on Iranian and Australian women on their views on uh, breast cancer and breast cancer screening. Yes. And I found that Australian women, they always went for screening. They would do their um, self-scan, mammography, everything, because they, they thought that they had a say in getting breast cancer and getting treatment. So they, they had a say in it. If they, they did the mammography and everything, they could detect the uh, cancer earlier and they would survive. But Iranians, they didn't even do the self-scan because they thought what the, the notion that came out of that, the main theme was Iranians would say, 
if something is meant to happen, it will happen. If that's part of my destiny, it's going to happen. If I'm going to die from breast cancer, I will. So there's no point of me, you know, undergoing screening. So they were, they were uh, very ignorant about it. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why the survival rate in Iran is much, much lower than Western countries such as Australia. Wow, I'm 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 grateful that you went to that place with your talking about your masters and that study you did because it dovetails into what I I was going to ask you before I let you go, which is uh, mm-hmm. I I know the reason Tina you're going to the United States is that your your mom has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, yes, yeah, she has been. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I um how is she, how is she doing? Um. Well, she's very she's being very brave, very strong, actually. Um, Yeah, she, you know, it was very difficult for both of us. I remember the day, uh, because she she did her, um, she did very um, basic tests in the US. And as soon as they suspected her of breast cancer, she flew to Iran because she wanted to see everyone before she knew for sure that she had breast cancer. And before she had to undergo a treatment. And so when she reached Iran, I said, you know, we have to go uh, get this checked further to make sure you, you know, to make sure you have breast cancer or we have to find out what it is. And I remember that day we were sitting at the doctors and, uh, the, you know, doc- some of the doctors in Iran, they're not really good at giving such news. and. Basically, he was very brutal about it. He was like, yes, it's cancer and, you know, you have to start your treatment immediately. Not much uh, empathy we didn't receive. But anyway, I remember, you know, it was devastating. It was really difficult for both of us. But um, she she was very strong about it. She's like, I faced all my fears. Um, maybe this is a challenge. This is a test um, for me. And I'm going to go through it and I'll be okay. So she was actually giving me hopes um, Mm -hmm. about it. And um, yeah, it was a big test because I worked on this for my masters and I was trying to tell women that they should um, stay positive about it and uh, know that they can be active and know that they can make a difference and how much mental health has a big say in survival. And then next thing you know, my own mother has uh, breast cancer. So I really have to walk the talk, um, basically, at the moment and uh, doing my best. And she's, yeah, she's doing fine. She's being very strong, very strong woman. And in the end, vis-a-vis the study you did, did she react, yeah. did she react like an Iranian woman or an Australian woman? No, she reacted like an Australian woman. Actually, she she had done her self exam and then she w- went to the doctor immediately. And so she's um, only stage one, which is good. And um, she's had her surgery and will be undergoing um, chemo and radiotherapy. So I'll be uh, flying there to support her through that. She's lucky to have you. We wish her the best. Be safe yourself going to all these places. Um, it's been Thank such you. a pleasure talking to you. I look forward to doing it again. Thank you for all the work Thank that you. you do on your, your Instagram channel, and thank you for coming on, Rook. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be safe. All right. Khodafis. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Tina Parselman, a psychologist and psychoanalyst, the host of the popular channel Insight with Tina Parsa on her Instagram platform of the same name. Tina Parsaman joined us from Dubai today. And this is full time for Rook for today. Remember the hub of all things Rook, our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, where you can also see our support Rook button. Thank you to our amazing team who all work so hard on this our little team of dazzling folks, Savvy Roham, Agamer Dodd, producer Susan Ponta, the artist, English Muhammad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thanks to all of you out there supporting us. Keep spreading the word. Mizun Washington.